Okay, cool. Uh, yes, uh, thanks everyone for joining this week's AI seminar. So today I'm very happy to introduce Professor Dong Yop uh, Kong. He's an assistant professor in the computer science department at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where he leads the Minnesota Natural Language Processing Group that aims to develop human-centered language technologies. So his group's research uh, lies at the intersection of computational linguistics, machine learning, and uh, human-computer interaction. He completed his postdoc study at the University of California, Berkeley, and obtained a PhD degree in the Language Technology Institute of uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah, so today, uh, Professor Dong Yop Khan is going to talk about fixing the NLP pipeline with humans and data. Great, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh... So let me start. Uh, yeah, so my name is Dongya, or you can just call me uh, DK, uh, which is my initial. Everybody could just call me DK these days. And, and in today's talk, uh, I'm going to talk about how we can involve more human knowledge or human's uh, perception into the NLP pipeline and also how we can better uh, manage the data sets or data pipeline in this uh, NLP uh, systems. And uh, I'm so excited to be invited uh, at ISI because my PhD advisor was actually from USC ISI at Harvey. So I'm so excited uh, to be like giving a talk here. And uh, feel free to uh, interrupts in the middle of the talk if you have any questions or if you put your questions on the the chat here I'm gonna regularly check them out uh, during the uh, in the in the middle of the talk okay uh, let me just make this small okay cool so uh, before we start I like to give you maybe <laughs> one uh, summary slide of what kinds of approaches our lab is working on so our lab is uh, aims to build a human centric language technologies. What do I mean by human centric? So we study uh, theoretical foundations uh, from uh, the computational linguistics, social science, or cognitive science. And then uh, with this interdisciplinary resume, we develop some computational models for NLP tasks. And then uh, based on these models, we develop uh, practical NLP systems that can interact with real human users and then see uh, what's missing and then see whether we can improve the human's uh, human activities in the real world. And as you know, uh, most NLP computational models here are built on top of machine learning framework. So we basically, basically collect data sets annotated by human authors, and we make sure the quality by looking at their interagreement scores, uh, et cetera. We split the data set into train and test sets and train our uh, deep learning or machine learning, oops, wait. <laughs> There was some delay, sorry. And then we train our model on the uh, train sets and evaluate it on the held out set, which is called test sets. And if the model output requires uh, some, some human judgments, such as like a generated text or speech, then we need uh, human evaluators to see the text or, or to listen the speech and then determine, hey, how, uh, determine how fluent or how coherent they are. And thanks to deep learning uh, and other fancy algorithms, we have achieved near human performance on many NLP tasks on this held out sets or the test sets in the leaderboard. However, when these uh, near human performing uh, models are deployed on the real world application, you may see lots of edge cases that these AI or NLP systems make uh, really problematic uh, outputs. And here are really well-known uh, issues of those uh, uh, those systems. So uh, you may see uh, robustness and generalization is the biggest issue uh, nowadays in ML and also NLP uh, field. And also deep learning models are really like a black box. So we can't explain or interpret how the output uh, is made uh, by, or they are really uh, difficult to control like oh I like to make my output to be more sentiment in this context or not or there's no way to control this kind of black box system and also there's no uh, standard way to evaluate this machine generated outputs because uh, imagine you're evaluating your dialogue system the reference uh, response uh, spoken by or written by another human uh, speaker that's going to be just one single snippet of possible responses. 
So, so uh, measuring this root score, blue score with this one particular example, and it may not cover the diversity of uh, linguistic variations of dialogue, human dialogues. And also, uh, as most of you already know, uh, this uh, data set we're using collected through the crowdsourcing or any other annotation pipeline, they contain artifacts. And then these artifacts make the models, uh, trained model to be really uh, biased towards the artifact. So the model is basically learning this artifact or bias uh, in the data set rather than the task itself. I'm gonna give you a little more examples. So yeah, there's a very famous paper uh, from Jia and Liang about robustness. So if you train your QA system using some benchmark uh, QA data set like a, a, a squad or whatever, yeah, the model makes a, a good prediction. But if you put uh, some random text at the end of the passage, the, the prediction just changed uh, in an in a, in a incorrect way. And also, uh, this is another example from the checklist paper. So if you replace uh, some word or some entity with another uh, word uh, on the same category, the model's behavior of like, oh, this, is, this was a positive sentence, but model changed like, like, oh, this is neutral now, or this is negative now. So these models are really, really fragile to this kind of uh, perturbation or adversarial examples. And also, this is the example from this annotation artifacts. So when you collect uh, uh, NLI or natural language inference data sets, you're given a premise and you're supposed to generate entailing, neutral, or contradicting sentences, right? But because of this setting, because of this annotation protocol, so for instance, uh, when you're producing the contra contradicting hypothesis, you just put the nots or put some negation words. And the model is then like the model trained on this kind of artifacts of the data set. Model is trying to see, oh, not looking at the premise and relationship between premise and hypothesis. They just look at the hypothesis and they see some negation words or verbs, then they think this is a contradiction. So this is a typical issue of this sort of like a bias or artifact in uh, NLP data set. Also, so, so basically how we can, how can we fix these problems? And of course, I'm not the person who can fix this all to get all, but I have a couple of suggestions, like how we can, how we have, why do we have to pay more attention on uh, human side or data side of this pipeline. So what I'm suggesting on top of this ML pipeline is first, uh, we need to pay more attention on the human side. So basically collecting how humans perceive uh, this particular instance or this particular language uh, variation and then collect their signal, collect their perception and then teach the uh, model to mimic the be behavior. We only do this during the evaluation stage or human, uh, some qualitative analysis stage, but not uh, throughout the learning stage yet. So what I'm saying is, can we actually collect such human signals or perceptions and ideally improve the model's perception? So that's the first uh, theme I'm gonna talk about. So here's an example first. So in a given uh, sentence written by uh, a human, uh, he or she said, I will understand if you decline, uh, but would very much like you to accept. Uh, may I nominate you? So given this sentence, uh, we ask other, human, uh, other humans to annotate whether the sentence is polite or whether the sentence is positive or offensive, etc. And of course, humans do pretty uh, good job on this. So human think, uh, this is polite, of course, and this is uh, quite positive, but I don't see any offense from the text. Uh, yes. And when humans do this task, I, or when humans identify this, this kind of linguistic styles from the text, they find some important words associated with the style. So for instance, when you identify the politeness of text, they see, oh, there might be a little a bit of like a hedging going on inside or some sort of gratitude or some words like a, a please or may. These make them to think this is polite text, right? So can we actually annotate such signals 
rather than just a sentence level uh, label, like this is polite or not. So what we did is we asked people to highlight which part or which span of the text they believe this is polite. And it turns out people annotated like the word un understand or like, accept, may, nominate. These are important words. They think this is polite text. Okay, that makes sense, right? And also uh, across the human annotator, there might be a little variation, but we only show the highly agreed uh, cases uh, in this particular example. And then we did a uh, same task, but now we are asking to the model. So we use the BERT classifier and uh, ask, ask it whether this is polite or not. And then of course, the, the classifier trained on politeness data set, it makes a correct prediction. It says, oh, this is flight text. Now we ask the same uh, task, which parts of the text you think were, uh, you think this is polite? And then uh, the, it turns out the birds are making really spurious uh, predictions over this words. So birds think the words like I, will, you, very much, you, accept, these are important words. Of course, uh, we used, uh, some, some gradient-based or attention-based methods to get this uh, highlight scores. And I'm not saying this is perfect methods, but as far as I know, this is the only way we can uh, explain why the model is making this kind of uh, prediction. And now we see there's a huge discrepancy perceiving politeness style between humans and birds, which is quite interesting. So we collect this kind of data sets uh, over different stylistic tasks like politeness classification, sentiment classification, and watch the next step. We, we, we found that there was a huge gap, right? Watch the next step. Next step, what we did is now we teach the birds to perceive styles as humans do. So look at this uh, simple classifier. So simple uh, birds uh, based sentiment classifier. So there's a bird encoding at the bottom. So it takes the input sentence and then there's a uh, some uh, multi-layer perception to make the decision of like this is positive or negative, which is a typical classifier, right? And then in the middle of this uh, encoder and the, uh, this final classifier layer, we make another new layer called a word level perception predictor. So this is basically predicting the importance or perception score of each token say, uh, in order to make the final decision of like, this is positive or negative. So in this uh, case, uh, the model think the word good or I are important while Phil is not. And how we can train, so it's gonna be another loss function, right? Token level loss function. So how we can train it? Because we do have the human annotated token level important scores from the previous data set. So we calculate their cross entropy so, and then do some multitask learning. And using this system, and we call it uh, style lex, which is lexicon based explanation for styles. And then using this, we, uh, we did some uh, prediction over not only just the sentence level uh, labels, but also uh, token level important scores. So look at some outputs. So, so on, the, on the same uh, text here, the both uh, stylex, which is our model, and the baseline BERT system think this is positive sentiments. But when you look at the predicted uh, important scores, uh, the stylex guided by human's perception is making much more fine-grained uh, outputs, like top-notch or emotional or positive, while the BERT's uh, saliency or grad attention scores are pretty much like uh, noisy including some content words or, yeah. What about, but uh, it's not always the case. So some, sometimes because of this uh, predicting word importance scores, it helps make the better prediction of this uh, sentence type of predictions. So for instance, uh, in this particular sentence, our model predicts insert and injury are important words for uh, detection of the emotion of disgust. But previously it was uh, incorrect. So model was making incorrect prediction, uh, but by highlighting, by making the model to highlight which words are important, now it's making the correct prediction, which is the benefit of uh, looking at this lexical level uh, perception. But it's not only the case. So in some cases, we also have negative cases. So uh, the model is making the correct uh, highlights on the word please for the detection of the politeness, 
but actually it's really sparse. So it misses some other important contextual words to make the final prediction. So it's not making the correct prediction of like impoliteness for this case. This is because uh, we collect, so first of all, collecting this lexical level annotation is super, uh, not super, sorry, expensive and time consuming. So we couldn't annotate every sentences in every benchmark, right? So we only coll collected a small subset, like a 500 to 1000. And then using this, we use uh, some classifier, uh, we, we train our model, and then we collect, we apply it to unlabeled data set uh, of the remain, uh, sorry, the the remaining unlabeled samples of this benchmark. And then we get some pseudo uh, important scores. And then take them and then we find, we train the whole model again in the combination of the small uh, Schumann annotated seed set as well as, well as this pseudo predicted uh, highlight scores. So that's why the model becomes really, really like uh, conservative in terms of, I mean, it's trying to make really accurate predictions only. So precision wise, it's pretty good, but sometimes it's making really sparse because we are using the pseudo labels. So that's the one bottleneck. And then we are trying to tackle up uh, by scaling up our annotation process, whatever. I'm gonna talk about it later. Okay, so in general, however, by looking at which parts are related to the task, like politeness or sentiments, we can actually have a better uh, generalization to out of distribution samples. So you can see uh, some relative improvement on some OD uh, data sets for different tasks. And sometimes it also improves the original data sets performance in the, for the in-domain dis in dis in distribution data set samples. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the, my question about like, hey, this is great. And we could observe both interpretability as well as uh, good generalization to out, out of the distribution uh, data set, right? But the thing is, uh, it's really expensive process and we need to anyhow scale up in some sense. And also this uh, survey based annotations are still not the reader perception when people read text. So is there any, better way we can collect the real perception when people uh, read like polite text or offensive text and then capture them and then uh, teach the model to better perceive that. So one idea, uh, one, of, one of ours, uh, one, of, one of the students in my lab is actually looking at a totally different approach. So now uh, she's looking at not just the, she's not collecting the data sets throughout the annotations, now she's uh, using some eye tracking devices. And then uh, she made some uh, some controlled setup. I'm not gonna talking about all the details about the setup, but uh, based on this controlled setup, she's trying to see how people read or uh, text when, uh, when they think about the sentiments or politeness. And then here's an example of this eye tracking uh, data set. So the task was like uh, something re related to uh, sentiment analysis. And when people perceive positive sentiments, uh, these red uh, shaded uh, spans of the text are the most uh, gazed parts of the text. So you can see people pay more attention uh, on the words like exhilarating or thriller, uh, minority, deliberate ring, and es uh, escapist or uh, intensifying, and so, etc. You can see a little bit of uh, noise and I'm not telling this is the cleanest uh, data set we can use, or I'm not saying this is better than uh, this external explicit annotations based on survey, but there must be some complementary factor. And then there must be some additional information we can learn from this, where this explicit annotations uh, may not have. So using this data set and then we teach the BERT model together with annotations and it turns out it's uh, helping a lot. So this work is still ongoing and I hope we hope uh, we can publish the results soon for, for NLP community. And then the other step, the next step is now we got some success on the style understanding task. Now uh, we ask people to read uh, the text written by real humans versus text written by GPT-3 or other uh, generation uh, models, and then measure their eye tracking movement. 
This is not real data sets. We are still waiting for the ILB approval for this, but this is an example. What if uh, their eye movement patterns might be different between human written versus machine uh, uh, written text? And based on this, can you develop the new coherence, texture coherence measure or engaging this measure out of this eye movement data set? When people read some un un incoherent part of the text, or when people read some inf uninfluenced parts, they may spend a little more time or go back and forth to check whether this is factual or coherent, right? So these all activities are stored in the eye tracking data set. So we believe, uh, we don't have any uh, initial results about this, but we strongly believe there might be something worn out uh, we can, we can, throughout this eye movement data set. And then, of course, uh, based on some seeding data sets, we're going to uh, train the model to produce this kind of eye movement data sets on the new data, and then we can scale up uh, using this uh, classifier or using this generator. So that's the long-term goal. All right, so that's, uh, so I have uh, three parts to discuss today, but that's the uh, most of the contents of, for the first part. Any question so far? Yeah, I think there's, there's a question in the chat. So are there any instructions that uh, indicate the eyeball movement is relevant to sentiment rather than something else? Oh yeah, so there are some literature from Kokusai or other philosophy uh, area that meaning meaning that there is a strong correlation between uh, people's linguistic perception on particular sentiment or emotion with eye movement data set. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Actually, uh, an another probably quick question is when you let people annotate token level salience or importance, let's say. Uh, do you observe that is actually a highly agreed uh, annotation or that's more like a very diverse uh, annotation? That's a really good question. So uh, we, on the same uh, stimuli, and then we we ask uh, three annotators to read the text, and it turns out there's not much overlap, and then it's really diverse. But I'm not saying, I, I don't like to say this diversity is a bad thing. It's not harm. In annotation process, having agreements and then uh, uh, secure this uh, interagreement score is important for eye movements. I think uh, union or overlapping might be the more important rather than uh, filtering out this uh, this mm. this disagreed part of the movement. Yeah. Yeah. So that means even if you have pretty diverse uh, uh, supervision to supervise language model to learn this kind of uh, token level salience higher cover coverage is actually even better, even that's diverse. I think so, yes, yeah. Cool. Cool, next question. Any other question? Oh, I can read uh, some of the questions, or there? Oh, yeah, so that's I, a question I already asked. Okay. <laughs> I think there's a, another question from this uh, open QA, whatever, yeah. How do you represent the eye movement as a graph of an image? Uh, so when you use this uh, sort of, uh, eye link type of uh, eye tracking device. There's a uh, multiple options and multiple features you can collect. Uh, it can be like uh, fixation patterns. It can be maximum length of your sakes, uh, or it can be like a dwelling time, whatever. So there's a uh, different features and there's not much work on uh, representing or uh, formatting this kind of eye tracking data set into NLP flavored uh, format yet. So we are still thinking of what would be the best way. For now, we're just storing every information in a JSON file and then uh, make some another scripts to handle it. But in the future, we may think of having that more NLP preferred way of like, oh, it, this token, the measurement was like this. But what about the SAC case, right? Going back and forth patterns. We didn't have a clear idea yet but there must be some way, yeah. Good question. Cool, yeah. All right, uh, let me move on then. So second part of the talk is about uh, interaction. Interaction between human and this kind of NLP models. And then ideally develop some interactive NLP system. So this is another way we can collect more humans data sets by making them to interact and by making them to collaborate on the same task. Uh, I will give you some example. So, uh, and before that, uh, we are particularly interested in some specific domain, which is a scientific domain. 
because I mean, you can you can build interactive system for medical domain, legal domain, whatever. But here we are particularly interested in scientific domain because there are various kinds of scientific activities we can help uh, on using NLP techniques. So for instance, how we can help Research, researchers to better read their tech, uh, their papers, write their papers, or review some analysis paper. And for each activity, uh, there are different ways or subtasks uh, we can help. So, for instance, for reading, uh, we can help for your scheming uh, activity, or proofreading, or close reading. Close reading here means like deeply understanding what the paper means. Also, uh, for writing, we can help by suggesting some some phrase or uh, some 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 sentence, or we can do some consistency checking, claim checking, and so on. And for reviewing, we can also look at their claim verification or automatic judgment. It's so many topics, and uh, we are actually working on different uh, sub tasks here. But today's talk, I'm going to talk about the two things. One is close reading uh, experience. And the other one is iterative text revision. So close reading uh, in collaboration with, uh, actually I was a postdoc at Berkeley. So Berkeley has a collaborated with AI2 semantic scholar team, and we built some new uh, PDF uh, reading interface. So here's the motivation. So if you read a new paper, especially the paper with machine learning uh, algorithms and heavy math notations, etc., you may see, uh, uh, you may often see like, uh, different terminologies are defined here and there. And these terms are called nonce words. So these words are actually defined in this particular paper. Outside the paper, nobody uses it with the corresponding meaning. But imagine you're reading papers over and over again. You have to memorize all of their uh, uh, definitions. And, and, and even this nonce words can be not just the terms, but it can be like uh, acronyms, it can be like symbols, like alpha is a hyperparameter, beta is blah, 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 or even like uh, new terms, of course. And they are, in fact, a lot in the paper, right? So that's why we, uh, and then memorizing all of them while reading the paper require you a lot of cognitive load. And it's really painful to memorize them all. And sometimes you forget, oh, what was the gamma? So you go back to the previous page and check it out, which takes a lot of time. So we developed some uh, augmented reading interface that provides uh, position sensitive, sensitive uh, definitions of these nonce words. And this system is called Scholarfy. So using this uh, tool, when you read a paper, and if you click a term, acronym, or a symbol, the system shows uh, its definition defined in this paper uh, using some tooltip bar. So if you click the alpha, the system pops up like alpha is a hyperparameter, something like that. If you click a complicated equation like this, it pops up the diagram of this uh, F definitions. And definition can be like not only just a single symbol, but also sub superscripts or su uh, uh, subscripts or the composite symbols, etc. And then, uh, and then, uh, when you are reading the paper by printing out as a as a as a uh, uh, the paper, then at the end of the PDF, we automatically produce this uh, new extra page of uh, summarizing all the terms and symbols uh, defined in the paper with their corresponding or uh, extracted definitions like this. So you can take this glossary uh, page as a additional uh, information for helping your reading. And then this, uh, the beta version of this system is uh, released uh, in the, the AI2's uh, Semantic Scholars uh, default PDF system. So you can use, and we hope uh, it's gonna be uh, scaled up for every paper in the sc uh, Semantic Scholar. Okay, so this is great. And in our uh, analysis, it turns out this interface helps better read uh, actually and better comprehend the paper. Now I'm more curious of, of like how we can use using the similar techniques. Can you also help scientists better write their papers? So, and we are curious like how humans or how scientists often write papers. In theory, uh, writing is like uh, 
and there are a bunch of theories, by the way. And then uh, one of the theory says like writing is a really complex and effortful cognitive task. And it's a linear uh, sequ uh, sequence of tasks of like planning, translation, and revision. But in fact, in the real life, uh, like we're, when we are writing some ACL paper, whatever, it's much, much more complicated. It's not just a linear, it's going to be recursive with multiple different steps. So you need pre-writing, do some uh, abstract of your paper, planning, drafting, reflection, peer review, editing, uh, proofreading, etc. And then imagine this is done by multiple authors. It's really complicated process and we like to help this procedure to be better. And particularly uh, we tackle this editing part first. And uh, more specifically, we are more interested in iterative uh, process of this editing. So why? Because human writers, we often uh, make revisions, not just a single time shot, right? We, we revise text over and over again, and then we make the version one of our draft, version two, version three, and so on, in order to improve the quality of the text or draft, right? So we wonder, like, is it possible to computationally model this sort of iterative revision process? So that was the question. And of course, there's no existing data set. So we first collect our data sets. We, data, we collect the data sets from a Wikipedia news article or Wikipedia page or even like archive data sets. And then the each uh, uh, instance of each domain, it looks like this. So there's a version one draft, version two draft by the same authors, version three, et cetera. And then for each version, uh, we make some uh, some taxonomy of uh, edit intention of each edit here. And then we annotate like, oh, this edit is about the improving the clarity. This is about like a changing the meaning itself. This is about coherence. This is about uh, fluency, etc. So yeah, and then we, we release the data set and it's going to be presented at ACL. But anyway, so that's the long story. But Using this data set, what we did is we actually make some computational uh, model that can revise the text. And then using this uh, system, we see whether the model is uh, model keeps revising some text, the overall quality improve, as well as whether their revision uh, process is similar to what humans do revision. So there are many research questions and we have done different uh, research, uh, experiments, but here's one of them. So we compare uh, for each document written by human, we compare how many revision steps are made by humans versus uh, this uh, revision uh, models uh, trained on our data sets. So we use the Pegasus and Felix model. Felix is another revision model developed by Google. Pegasus is uh, end-to-end based uh, system, uh, sick-to-sick based uh, text revision model, fine-tuned on our data set. And it turns out uh, this Felix model, uh, it's making good progress in terms of uh, having more high quality outputs over and over again. But the thing is, it never stop. It doesn't know when to stop. So it keeps making some revisions over and over again. While humans know like, oh, maybe after this revision, I have to stop. Maybe after the uh, three times of revision, I have to stop. And it turns out the models are not actually making the similar numbers of revisions compared to human uh, editors. And we need uh, more uh, analysis uh, later on. And actually we are building the more robust model and then compare their patterns with the humans and so on. But yeah, that's, uh, that's the one uh, initial result we have. And another one is using this system. What if uh, we build a system that can revise the text together with uh, humans, human uh, editors? So let me uh, play this uh, video for you. When first launching the Human in the Loop Iterative Text Revision System, users are asked to enter their usernames. Then, the revision system shows brief guidelines and starts running a revision model on the first document. On the left-hand side, we have a drop-down menu where users can choose from a list of documents. We can see the parts that are suggested for revision are highlighted in colors. For example, in this document, we have five revision suggestions. We see that the first one is further colored in red and displayed on the right-hand side. 
It suggests deleting the part of the text for clarity purposes. Users can either accept or reject the revision suggestion and confirm their choice to move on to the next one. This process is repeated for all five revision suggestions. In the end, users can submit their feedback, which is then saved into JSON format on the server. Now, users can proceed to the next iteration of the text revision. We can see that the user's accepted and rejected revisions are reflected in the text accordingly. And based on this new text, the model has suggested six more revisions. Users provide feedback in the same way as before. At the end of the second revision, the model has no more revisions to suggest, and thus the iterative revision process is now completed for this document. It is possible to check out the current state of the revision process for debugging purposes. Okay, so this is one demo. Users can now move on to the next document by selecting it in the drop down menu. This outlines the process of our human in the loop iterative text revision system. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so this is one uh, demonstration paper we, we, we developed for human and machine uh, collaborative text revision. And we compare the quality or this uh, user, user uh, experience throughout this system with against uh, machine only revision uh, outputs versus human only editing and then see whether this uh, human machine collaborative revision might be better way than human only editing etc cool and then uh, besides this uh, when first one okay let me okay. the human in the wait yeah and besides that uh, so this uh, revision is one type of uh, subtask we are tackling uh, the 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 writing experience, but we are actually building another features like uh, when you write your paper using Overleaf, is, is it possible to see whether this uh, two word, two phrases are inconsistent? So maybe a uh, system is flagging a, a suggestion like, hey, these two are meaning the same, but actually written in a different way. Why don't you make to be the same? Something like that. Or the system automatically finds uh, some particular uh, paragraph you have written and then say, oh, uh, the coherence level is pretty low. Why don't you revise it like this way? Or clarity is really low. Why don't you make this part more clear using the revision system we built? Or when you write in real time, by looking at your context or previous uh, sentence or discourse structure, we can actually auto suggest uh, the possible uh, phrase to type in. So these are all like uh, uh, the NLP features or NLG features. We can improve the human's writing experience. Uh, and then we are actually building this kind of writing assistance in collaboration with uh, Grammarly. All right, so that's all about the interactive parts. Uh, before we move into the data parts, which is the last, uh, any questions so far? Okay, there's, I guess there's no question. Okay, so the last part is, uh, yeah, throughout the interaction with humans and machines, can you actually improve the data annotation pipeline as well? And we have uh, one recent work published at iClear in terms of the augmentation. And the other one is uh, about uh, improving the annotation experience, uh, but it's still under review. But I'm, uh, because I don't, we don't have much time today, so I'm, I will only cover the second part, which is annotation. So let me just uh, quickly go through the annotation parts. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the basic question is how we can characterize a data set, a data set of like for NLP benchmarking. And then is it possible to quantify the informativeness of each data point in the data set? So it's basically similar to the motivation of the active learning, right? So find, uh, annotate the more difficult examples so make the whole annotation pipeline to be more efficient. But we are looking at a whole data set, not just the individual sample. And they're looking at the whole data set and character, characterize the data set more deeply. So that's the main, uh, main, major thing. And then before that, yeah, I like to introduce this um, really uh, interesting and motivational paper. I think, I think most of you already know because Swaba is joining USC soon. So this paper, 
uh, projects uh, all the samples in particular data set. In this case, they use the NLI data set, I think. And then they project them into two spaces. One space is how confident the model is to predict uh, the, 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 the inference label of this particular sample. The other dimension is uh, the, the model is predicting whether it's intelling or contradicting or not, and then see their prediction over the course of the training epochs. So let's say, oh, in the first epoch, while the training is not complete yet, but in the first epoch, oh, this is Intel. Second epoch, Intel. But third epoch, contradicts, contradicts, contra. So we measure this variation of this uh, predictions over the training epochs. And then uh, they project these samples over these two spaces. And it turns out some samples are clustered uh, on the left uh, top and they call it easy to learn because they're, they are, they're having some really high confidence but low variability. So the, there's, the model is not changing their minds with, the, with the high confidence. So it's really easy to learn. The, the samples on the right side and also middle, they are really ambiguous because uh, they are changing the predictions over and over again. And also the confidence is not that high. The most tricky part uh, is labeled as hard to learn in the paper. And they said it's really hard because the model is not changing their prediction at all, but actually it's wrong and it's, it's uh, not confident. So they make this really interesting uh, uh, grouping of samples in the data sets uh, by looking at this two uh, learning dynamic features, right? Which is really interesting. I think this is really interesting paper and we are, our, our lab is so much uh, motivated by this. So what we did is really simple. They look at two dimensions, right? Two dimensions of like uh, confidence and variability. What if we look into other dimensions other dimensions like maybe area under margin, entropy, or batch, et cetera. So we look at, we, we extend it as a multi-dimensional uh, analysis of this learning dynamics altogether. And then we actually, we look into total like a 23 measurement uh, by looking at uh, the latest uh, uh, preprints on new libs or ICML, ACL and so on. And then we try to make really comprehensive list of this learning dynamic metrics. You can take a look at the paper later, but yeah, I will skip the details for now. And then what we did is, so, so basically we have the new dimension, this 23 dimension of each data point. And this is different from semantic dimension, right? Semantic embedding. Semantic embedding is about the meaning, but this one is whether how the model training think of this data point. Is it difficult? Is it confident? Is it uh, tricky or et cetera, right? So we call this uh, new dimension as information burst. So which is shortly infoburst, okay? And then we, we're gonna compare this infoburst with semantic embedding space and also this uh, data cartography space. So let's look at the projection of uh, samples in the semantic space first. So basically we train some uh, NLI classifier and then take the last, uh, uh, the representation of each sample from the last layer, and then we project them. And then the red uh, circles or red squares are, uh, I think uh, it's positive cases and uh, blue one is a negative labels, I think. I forgot the class, but anyway. And then this uh, gray and black uh, points are actually the, the test samples that the model are not making the correct predictions. So you can see there are some, some black uh, points uh, here and there, and, but it's really difficult to figure out in which area or which semantical, semantic area they're making some mistakes. And it's really hard to capture by looking at their semantics only. How about data cartography space? You can see that this black uh, points uh, appear around ambiguous little, uh, re uh, region a little bit, and also a lot of uh, appears on the hard to learn region, right? Which is great. I mean, this cartography space give, give us some insights, like the difficulty of each sample, informativeness of each sample. What we did is we do the same thing, but using our info uh, burst uh, space feature. So, and then find the mapping between them. And it turns out uh, many, uh, many of these incorrectly uh, predicted samples are really uh, distinguishable in our space, 
in the infoverse. Let's take a deeper look. Look at this. So you can see these black uh, points are well clustered into the smaller regions in our space. And some spaces, they have a different confidence or probability uh, ratios, and then we can find some really dis uh, distinctive uh, regions. And uh, let's take a look at deeply. I, I, don't, I think we don't have much time, but yeah, for this particular region, this uh, samples in this region have lots of uh, high ensemble uncertainty. And then we uh, deeply look at the, the, the cases that belongs to this category. What about the other region? This region has a high uh, uncertainty as well as a variability and a strong co confidence and intermediate uh, uh, uncertainty as well, uh, MC uncertainty as well. So we, for each region, we do some deeper analysis and whether uh, they are mislabeled whether they are really challenging, whether they require some external knowledge because uh, because of this, it's really challenging, et cetera. So we like to characterize uh, this difficult case, uh, informativeness of each data point using this infoverse. And then using this infoverse, we can actually build, uh, build up the way better active learning scheme compared to other all other uh, previous methods. We can use this for data printing. We can even use this for data annotation. So we got pretty good uh, positive like results uh, using this extra meta learning features for other data related uh, tasks, as I mentioned. Cool, that's all about uh, today's talk. And then uh, I will give you uh, just a three sentence summary of my talk today. So what I did in the first uh, phase is I annotate this lexicon uh, importance uh, scores or collect them using eye mov movements. And then it turns out they are actually helping for better interpretability as well as a generalization to out of distribution data sets. Second part, we actually build interactive NFP systems for helping scientists or writers better read, write, and revise text. Third part, we are so much interested in data, so we characterize the data or each point in the data set using this meta learning features. And then it helps uh, better uh, annotation, augmentation, or active learning. Okay, so that's all about the talk. And I saw two questions in the channel. And then, sorry, uh, by the way, so this work all done by uh, other collaborators and students with, uh, working with me. So I really appreciate uh, their efforts. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks Ooh. a lot, Dong Yip. This is a great talk and also very impressive works. Uh, yeah, I think a couple of questions already posted in the chat. Uh, I also have follow-up questions as well. So let's start with, uh, I guess it's EUN's question. So do you, uh, I think it's probably re relevant to your second part. So do you think these models would lead people optimize the metrics, therefore compromise some, uh, let's see, Diversity is in writing, so which is somehow imaginative, but thinking about non-negative English speakers who try to conduct English essay writing. Very, very interesting. Uh, there is uh, some ongoing HCI project that I'm working with uh, other HCI folks to 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 validate. The, sorry, uh, to quantify the effect of this human AI collaborative writing systems. We measure not just the productivity, but also creativity. And I think here you mentioned diversity. I think it's more likely uh, creativity in the creative writing uh, tasks, right? We didn't have the final results yet, but I totally agree in some sense by taking, by, by looking at the suggestions by the system, your creativity, or your diversity to think about the other uh, possibility might be reduced. And I think it's gonna be biased or affected at least. And yeah, this is really good insight and I totally agree. And we hope we can get some uh, empirical, uh, some some results we can support this, yeah. Okay, cool, yeah, thanks. So uh, another question is from myself. So for the third part of your talk, I'm thinking, uh, for example, uh, we do different kind of transfer learning, domain adaptation, or just cross distribution transfer or cross task transfer. 
Or in other situations, we combine multiple learning resources from different sources to do multitask learning. Do you think uh, your technique can be used to quantify how effectively those transferred indirect supervision from other learning resources that would help a specific uh, target? That's, that's a very interesting question because well, we, with the undergraduate student here, using this InfoBird space, we look at this uh, in the in distribution samples versus uh, OD samples, and then how they are projected and how they are distinguishable well on this infrared space, and then it turns out they are quite distinguishable in the space. We haven't looked at the possibility of the multitask or other multi-domain yet or multi zangli yet, but I think it's really exciting uh, direction to look into. Yeah, great. Yeah, cool. Any other question? Yeah, just to mention, yeah, uh, relevant to that, uh, relevant to that, uh, that line of study, there's another paper uh, called PABI, which is from uh, Daros group. Okay. That is also a way of uh, measuring the informativeness between uh, two data sets. But typically oh. over there, they are considering you are doing some kind of transfer learning from one data set. I see. Process, yeah, we can we can discuss more uh, during the round meetings. But yeah, do you mind sharing the paper? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I want to mention this is because in case I for, I forget to do so later. Cool, cool. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah. Great. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, actually, uh, another question is about your first part of the talk. Mm -hmm. So let's say uh, for uh, token level salience, mm -hmm. I think uh, previously there were also some other kind of methods which is not to learn this kind of uh, token level salience, but uh, let's say we can do some kind of uh, counterfactual inference. You can consider you have a sentence. Then over there, one way to uh, justify the salience of each token is that you can remove each token. Mm. That that's that's say leave one out, and uh, calculate the plus uh, perplexity of language model and see how much the perplexity changes. Uh, I'm not sure if you have thought about this kind of uh, very simple technique, but uh, would that be? Uh, do, do you have an estimation about you know your your supervised uh, methods versus you know this kind of unsupervised method, just, just, just based on language model perplexity, how, how large the delta will be. Yeah, that's really interesting thought. Uh, we haven't looked into this counterfactual based and then find the diff and then yeah make that diff as a saliency measure. We haven't directly compared with those techniques. We do we did some comparison with other techniques like self-explain. So having the similar architecture, but make the model uh, predicts the important score in unsupervised way, but there seems to be a really huge difference between human annotated salience versus machine saliency. But yeah, I think that idea of like a counterfactual example or yeah, looking at the perplexity, this seems to be really good, a uh, strong baseline for us to compare with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I, I saw that Jay raised his hand. So Jay, you want to ask a question? Yeah, um, I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks. Um, it was very exciting um, to hear all of this. We've also looked at um, this question of revisions on archive. And one of the, the goals we had was try to see um, how reviews might change people's revisions. We had a lot of difficulty finding kind of meaningful changes in response to reviews. So wondering if you had any advice for this topic about how people revise papers in response to you know, uh, criticism and suggestions from the scientific community. Oh, that sounds like a really interesting problem. <laughs> so first of all, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, you can you can get some sort of data set, right? So collect some reviews and then find the paper ID on the archive and then see, uh, keep tracking, uh, I'm align the timeline and then, yeah, find it, right? Uh, maybe just to clarify, I mean, I think one of the problems is that 
either you see very minor revisions, in which case you don't very, learn very much about this revision process that you were describing, mm -hmm. or the paper changes so much that it's very hard to kind of understand what, you know, what the changes were and what they were responding to. Mm -hmm. And so it was either too much or too little. And I, I wonder if you had any experience with that or if you have any thoughts on that or kind of what your take is on, on, on kind of learning in, in those sorts of situations. I see, I see. We haven't uh, quantified the amount of revision for each paper and then maybe uh, cluster the papers with big revision, small revision, and then find a relationship with their acceptance ratio. I mean, this sounds all like a really exciting new problem, but we haven't, haven't looked into it. But I'm pretty sure uh, people do minor revision for their camera ready submission, but maybe if the paper is rejected, there must be a lot of uh, meaning change revision as well as other coherence, uh, et cetera, right? Because most of the reviewers are complaining about like uh, presentation of your work and coherence as well, as, uh, unless there is no critical claims uh, on the paper or something like that. So yeah, I think, yeah. We haven't looked into it, but it sounds really interesting problem. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, boss. Um, so I guess uh, we are about to uh, reach in 12 a.m. Uh, sorry, 12 p.m. So yeah, thanks a lot, Donya, for this very informative talk and uh, very impressive works that I introduced at here. So I uh, really look forward to some uh, continuing uh, discussion with you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, invitation, and I'm so enjoyed with uh, question answering. Yeah. See okay. you. See you soon, all. Yeah. Yeah. See you soon. Bye. Bye.